Um, we're going to now move on um, and do um, some of the so talk talk about two cases in a kind of multidisciplinary um, team meeting approach. So um, we will present the first case um, and then we'll ask our panelists to come back and we will discuss the first case. And then we've got another case and we'll ask our panel to come back after that one and also discuss it. Um, if any of the um, uh, people listening would like to ask questions, please pop it in the chat and we can try to discuss it all together. Um, so the first um, uh, case will be presented by Dr. Stella Fakru, who is a clinical fellow in inherited cardiac conditions and heart failure at uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. So thanks very much um, for speaking, Stella. Um, and yes, please take it away. OK, uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Excellent. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Congratulations for the fantastic talk so far. And thank you for having me a part of it. So we'll start with the first case today. So it is a gentleman, 28 years old, um, who presented in our clinic in 2018 with dizziness. And he mentioned that he had two episodes of syncope, both of them uh, during um, at, at rest. One was when having a beverage and the other one um, sometime after sexual intercourse. Uh, the EC, he didn't have any other um, health problems and his ECG uh, showed sinus rhythm, um, LVH and T-wave inversion in the lateral and inferior leaves. The echo he had before the clinic showed normal LV size uh, with low normal systolic function with an estimated ejection fraction around 50 to 55 percent. There was significant global left ventricular hypertrophy with maximal wall thickness about two centimeters in the basal anterior lateral wall. And there was no uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction or systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet at rest or upon provocation with Valsalva. The coronaries were also normal and um, he was not taking any illicit drugs and or any other medications. When we asked him about his family history, he mentioned that he had a healthy brother, a healthy parents in the age of 40s that uh, did not have any uh, known health problem, but the rest of the family was living in Lithuania and they were not into, relay, into contact. So he couldn't provide us more information regarding a sudden cardiac death or any cardiomyopathy in the family. Uh, so our first question for now is what is the most likely diagnosis uh, for this man? Um, is it a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy or a dilated cardiomyopathy based on the evidence we have so far? So yeah, this gentleman has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, based on the echo and the symptoms in the ECG. So the next question is uh, which test would you do next? Would that be a cardiac MRI, an exercise treadmill, a 24-hour holder, or all of the above? So, um, if you were able to vote, I'm hoping you would say all of the above, because each of these tests would provide us with significant information um, and would guide us on our strategy. So, I will show here the cardiac MRI of this gentleman. Uh, we can see on the third chamber view on the left that um, the LV has severe global hypertrophy. Uh, the maximal wall thickness was measured at around two centimeters. It was mildly dilated on the MRI. The ejection fraction was estimated to be slightly reduced, 50%. And as we can see in the three chamber view, there was no LVOT obstruction or SAM. The RV was normal in size and function. And the native T1 maps were slightly reduced with a value of 920 milliseconds compared to the reference values for the lab. So the conclusion for this study by them, uh, we had, sorry, we had the lateral delirium enhancement images, which surprisingly showed extensive dense patchy areas of medieval fibrosis, which were more prominent in the basal and mid anterior, inferior and, la and lateral walls. So the conclusion for the study was that probably this represents a burnt out or advanced hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or an HCM phenocopy. Um, what are the next steps then in the um, in the handling of this in the management of this um, patient? Shall we ask refer him for genetic testing? Shall we request more detailed studies such as the alpha galactosidase levels? 
uh, should we offer screening for the first degree relatives and what would be the risk stratification for sudden cardiac death? Again, all of the above are appropriate in the management of this patient, and we will explain in the, in the following slides the reasons for this. Unfortunately, though, our patient was lost to follow up. He was denial about the disease that he had. He, he was handling OK with his symptoms, and he was, but then he stopped his medication, so he was not compliant. So he only presented to our clinic three years later in 2021, some months ago, and he experienced shortness of breath on exertion as literally New York Heart Association two symptoms, heart failure symptoms. He, start, he started just a few weeks before the appointment, um, his medication with beta blocker and ramipril, and um, we did the following test. So the um, ECG did not so much difference from the previous one, uh, but the echo showed severe left ventricular dilatation with an end diastolic diameter around nine centimeters and severe LV impairment with an injection fraction estimated around 20%. There were no signs of pulmonary hypertension, no valvular disease, and uh, the right ventricle again was normal. Uh, blood tests turned back again normal without showing any other uh, multi-organ disease, especially with the liver and the renal function. And there were increased pro anti pro BMP and troponin T suggestive of the cardiomyopathy and the hypertrophy and the heart failure. So the MRI he had. Uh, the second MRI he had three years later uh, showed in the four chamber view the severely increased LV volumes, the concentric LVH with a maximum wall thickness around 15 millimeters, uh, the systolic function which was severely impaired with an estimated ejection fraction around 26 percent. There were regional wall motion abnormalities, especially in the inferior and lateral wall, but overall the cardiac output was preserved. The, norm, the right ventricle was normal in volume, mass and function, and the native T1 maps was also normal. With the late gadolinium imaging, uh, we showed extensive dense subedocardial fibrosis of the basal mid-lateral wall, which was almost transmural, as you can see in the top left uh, image. And there were also dense foci of mid-wall fibrosis in the basal mid-anterior wall and the septum, and smaller punctuate areas of, fi of fibrosis um, in the apex. So the conclusion of the study was that this could represent a concentric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenocopy, but not typical images for sarcomeric HCM. So the next question has to do with an ICD. Would you refer the patient for ICD? Um, uh, we decided to actually refer the patient to the ICD, and the reason we did that is explained in this slide. So, we, risk stratification for sudden cardiac death is um, central in the evaluation of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and any form of it, and actually in any inherited cardiac condition. Um, valuable tool is the um, HCM risk calculator available by the European Society of Cardiology. However, uh, it is limited with patients with sarcomeric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and does not take into account reduced left ventricular function. Our patient is not a classical case of sarcomeric HCM, so, we, so this risk calculator would not be accurate and, and we shouldn't use it in this case. There are also some other high risk traits that can be uh, used for risk stratification, such as the extensive fibrosis on MRI, the left ventricular systolic dysfunction and the risk for arrhythmias, and also the family history of sudden cardiac death. The, the AHA and ACC guidelines propose this algorithm for ICD patient selection. So uh, uh, there is clear recommendation whether there is prior event of sudden cardiac death, VF or VT, uh, but if this is not um, hap if this hasn't happened, then at least of the following can give a recommendation for an ICD, which is the family history for sudden cardiac death, the massive LVH more than three centimeters, unexplained syncope, apical aneurysm, or an injection fraction less than 50%. So if any of these is present, an ACD is reasonable. If none of this is present, then the, the um, appearance of NSVTs can guide us for an ICD um, uh, offer or the extensive LG on the MRI. Uh, we should also have in mind that uh, there is diverse etiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so actually it's a group of diseases. Sarcomeric proteins account only for 40 to 60 percent of the cases, while 5 to 10 percent of cases are uh, other causes, uh, genetic or non-genetic. Based on our case, we should clearly rule out three major diseases. One is the Dunant disease, 
Uh, in that respect, questions regarding learning difficulties or skeletal myopathy uh, and special tests such as the alpha glucosidase levels or mutations in the lumped genes should be investigated. Another disease is the Anderson Fabry. Um, symptoms such as burning pain, hands, feet, renal dysfunction, no perspiration, hearing loss, or corneal diseases uh, should mark uh, should be red flags. Uh, alpha galactosidase levels is also very important to check. Uh, and then it is the mitochondrial diseases such as the mellas, in which muscle weakness, encephalopathy or hearing loss, retinopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes can also guide us towards this uh, diagnosis. And of course, in this case, mutations in the mitochondrial DNA would be the diagnostic. Uh, would be diagnostic. So what is the future management of our patient? Uh, he has a heart failure symptoms, reduced ejection fraction. Now he has an ICD. Genetic testing has been offered. Specific diagnostic tests are underway and family screening has been offered for those who accepted it. But what about the cardiac transplantation? When is the optimum time for referral? Uh, the truth is that our patient had rapid progression to heart failure in, though, in these three years. And we have to think in mind to have in mind that HCM with reduced ejection fraction, which is less than 50%, is related to poor prognosis and increased risk for sudden cardiac death. So the guidelines, the 2020 guidelines of um, AHA, ACC have um, um, suggested this algorithm. So we'll go through having in mind our patient who has systolic dysfunction with an ejection fraction less than 50%. Uh, he needs to take so heart failure guideline treatment. He should be evaluated for other causes of reduced EF. He should discontinue any negative inotropic agents and an implantable cardiac defibrillator should be offered. Next, um, then the, re the, the, the timing to evaluate for transplantation actually is uh, related to the development of heart failure symptoms. So New York Heart Association symptoms three to four is an indication of cardiac transplant or CRT if LBBB develops. And then if there is recurrent risk of arrhythmias, then again, the patient should be referred for cardiac transplant. So the learning points based of this, um, of this case is that hypertrophic myopathy describes a common phenotype which is linked to diverse causes and we should look for them. The cardiac MRI is important in differential diagnosis and risk stratification. We should have an individualized approach for risk stratification and shared decision making plan of care with a patient. And then we should promptly consider for cardiac transplantation referral when the systolic function is impaired and that is less than 50% in the HCM cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Stella. That was a, a, a really uh, super presentation and, and a very interesting case. So if all of the panel members can, who are still with us, if they can um, join the meeting and maybe we can discuss a few different aspects. Stella, you could stop sharing your slides. Yes. Super. Um, OK, so um, uh, I will open up the questioning um, to so so to, to 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 the panel members that are still in the call. Um, so genetic testing, alpha galactosidase level um, screening of family members um, uh, that will be done. At, at which stage would you consider an endomyocardial biopsy for this patient? Wait for the test to be done or um, do it along with the tests. Any thoughts? So I, I mean, I would probably come in as a general comment around this case. I do think getting a diagnosis here is clearly important. Um, I mean, obviously this may end up becoming easier from a inverted commas biopsy perspective if you're going to end up going down a transplant route. Um, but there's question th th there's a whole number of questions around the bit before that <laughs> with this. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I'll be very surprised if this were Fabry disease. I, I've not seen Fabry present like that uh, with that sort of impressive late enhancement and those very sort of punctate type uh, lesions with it. Uh, and clearly from as far as we know, there's not any family history, although from memory that relatives are abroad, but there's obviously nothing catastrophic in the family. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, as, as you went through towards the end of this, I was thinking I probably want to biopsy this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite when you do it in the context of things, I don't know. But I, I, I suspect you would come to do it unless it, it would just, you know, if you got an obvious answer from doing other things, 
saves you the need to do it. It's just obviously the part of the problem is some of those things take quite a long time to find out the result of. That's the problem, isn't it? If you could find out the results quite quickly, <laughs> you'd be more willing to sit and wait a little bit. Um, Super. Uh, and as you've got a uh, comment, any role for any other types of biopsies, muscle biopsies in specific cases, mm -hmm. would you want uh, signs of extra cardiac involvement if you're going to um, biopsy muscles first? Uh, are you asking me? Uh, yes, yeah. Well, firstly, let me answer about the cardiac biopsy. Um, yes, I would do it. And I think I have two reasons to go there. One is to do the cardiac biopsy, and the second is to do a right heart cuff. Because in a patient who is progressing like this and so fast, we heard earlier today, and I think we we, we know anyway, that, that it, it, there is a risk here. And the risk is that the patient may miss the, the opportunity to be transplantable. And yes, uh, the echo can give us some non-invasive inf information on that, but maybe not. So you want to be sure, you want to play safe here, and you want to measure the, the pressures and the resistance in the in the pulmonary circulation um, sooner than later. And if it's fine, it's fine, you can monitor it, but, but then um, you want to know that. And then if you're there, you will do the biopsy as well, which may or may not give you um, diagnostic information. We, we are aware of the limitations of the biopsy. Uh, as for the your uh, second question about the peripheral muscle biopsy, mm, if you have zero phenotype in in the in outside the heart, mm, maybe not. But if you have an elevated CK, if you have something else to suggest that there might be um, a peripheral muscle involvement, then yes. And in some ways, in some diseases rather, it's easier to interpret the peripheral muscle. Uh, biopsy results rather than the cardiac uh, biopsy results. Um, and I'm, I'm referring to mitochondrial diseases. Sometimes it's easier in the periphery. So yes, but I need, you need to be guided by something, not, not go blinded um, just because you don't get a cardiac diagnosis. And of course, you wouldn't go there until you get the results of the all, all the of the right tests you have already performed. Uh, you're expecting for a, um, um, a good number of results. So I think you should wait for them. Can uh, If I may, uh, uh, make a comment as well, um, which is my obsession probably rather than what people um, usually um, want to, to hear. But you call this hypertrophy concentric. Um, can you defend that? Uh, because I may say that this is eccentric. Dan, you, you're, you're laughing already. But uh, I, I, I agree. Was, you agree already. <laughs> okay, fine. Stella, any, do you want to make any comments? No, I mean, OK, the concentric hypertrophy, yeah, it's difficult to defend that. I mean, uh, it's based on the on the MRI images that look more homogenous, but um, yeah. Uh. <laughs> sorry, sorry, this is symmetrical. What you're referring to is symmetrical. Okay. Concentric means it takes space from the inside the heart. Eccentric okay. means that the inside of the heart is same or larger. And what okay. you have here is eccentric because the inner dimension of the heart is, is larger, where concentric would have been if the and diastolic volumes were smaller. And then Thank it's you. a different thing, different thing whether it is symmetrical or asymmetrical. And what you're referring to is symmetrical indeed. You're right. Yeah, so I, I agree. Yes, thank I you. imagine certainly on the most recent scan, um, things would have been defined as eccentric if we'd gone by relative wall thicknesses and um and and um cavity to um mass ratios and things. So yes, thanks, Antonis. Um, James, would you be happy to put this chap uh, on the treadmill and do a CPET? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think it's going to add anything towards um, your diagnostics. I mean, a lot of people, I, I don't believe in the dark arts of CPET as much as other people. I know some CPET reporters who think they can see telltale signs of mitochondrial disease and things like that on cardiopulmonary exercise tests. I'm not saying they can't, but I'm certainly saying that I wouldn't be confident <laughs> enough to do that. Very good. Thanks. That's very honest. Um, okay, any other comments from, from anybody or shall we move on to the to, to the next case? Super. Okay, do. take it away, Amanda. Perfect. Um, so we've got one further case uh, with Dr. Sarandeep Mahawa. Uh, she is a clinical fellow, a research fellow for cardiac risk in the Young and St. George's Hospital, um, and she's going to be presenting a specific arrhythmogenic heart mile hospital. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, can you see my 
slides? Yes, I can see your slides. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, so I'm going to do a case-based discussion and the importance of being thorough. <clears throat> so um, a gentleman, Mr X, had originally presented in a, uh, another hospital in London with an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, he was an avid sporting uh, person who always used to play regular football, he used to cycle and he used to do fast-paced walking. And whilst he was playing football on the weekend, he um, had a cardiac arrest and was noted to be in VT. At the time, he didn't receive any shocks by the ambulance as they felt that his blood pressure was adequate enough, although they did try adenosine at the time. He came into hospital uh, and he was continuing to be in v VT. They sedated him and they gave him one shock and he uh, reverted back to sinus rhythm. So with regards to his background, he's normally fit and well, he's asymptomatic, he doesn't, uh, he's never smoked, and he doesn't take any regular medication or has any other medical conditions. On the initial assessment on a uh, V-scan, which is our portable echoes uh, that they do in the emergency care, uh, it showed a mildly impaired LV, um, but no regional wall motion abnormalities, but he went on to having a coronary angiogram, which did showed a normal uh, coronary artery system. He was still, uh, as an inpatient and two days later he had further VT which then went on to a VF arrest. He required a single shock and that restored back into sinus rhythm. So what next for this gentleman? Would you want to put an ICD in him as a secondary prevention? Um, he's got normal coronaries. Uh, do you just up titrate his beta blockers, uh, see how he gets on with this if he's stable as an inpatient and then do a whole trust and outpatient to see if he's stable? Would you want to do an inpatient MRI or would you want to do other things? So these are the things that would normally come through your mind um, as he's an inpatient. And because he's quite young, um, they were leaning towards an ICD, but they obviously wanted to do further testing. He was up titrated on a beta blocker um, and he was monitored as an inpatient, but he did go on to having an MRI as an inpatient prior to an ICD. So I hope you can see these images. <clears throat> So um, you've had some lectures earlier on on cardiac MRI and we've got the four chamber, the two chamber and the three chamber here. So on his um, MRI, there's no obvious significant regional wall motion abnormality, but his uh, LV was mildly dilated uh, when they um, index for volume. And um, although his two chamber probably looks a little bit better, but globally is mildly impaired. Um, his ejection fraction was coming up over around about 48%. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> so on um, stir images, there was some enhancement um, around the suburb um, endocardium there. And if you look at the short axis, it's more towards the apex. So there was suggestion of possible edema or inflammation on the submission. Um, Sorry, I'm only delayed to 41%. So um, his um, gadolinium, um, as you can see, there was some subtle basal septal um, scar, which is subendocardium again. Then there's some suggestion of mid wall scarring in the basal infralateral wall here. Um, and if you follow the short axis again on the lateral wall, some epicardial um, scarring as well. So it was very. Um, different forms of patterns of scar, which uh, they could not quite put their finger on. Now, we haven't got their ECG on his admission, but we, uh, because we was the second hospital, we've got hold of the ECG post ICD. He was requiring pacing and he was mainly atrial paced. Um, as you can see that there's some short, uh, small complexes in the infra uh, inferior leads, um, but otherwise there was uh, nothing that was there's flattening of his T waves in V5 and V6. There was documentation that post arrest there was uh, some T wave inversion in the infra, um, in the lateral leads. Sorry. <clears throat> so uh, we're still at his primary hospital, which he got admitted to. What next? So what were the differentials that they're considering or thinking about, and how do we work this person up? So the thing that you may think of is this is an acute inflammation. Could this be myocarditis? There was suggestion of edema on the uh, MRI. Do we need to do a CPET? Uh, the fibrosis is uh, not typical of uh, arrhythmogenic, um, well, right arrhythmogenic or um, 
could this possibly be sarcoid or infiltrative disease? Would you want to do a Brugada uh, assessment and give adjmaline? Do you do a halter? Would you refer him for genetics? Um, and is family screening important here? Because he's quite young, he's in his 50s. So with regards to um, CPET, he did actually go on to having that because we really wanted further um, assessment of uh, whether anything else was going on, uh, which came back normal. He did end up having an adjmalin test, um, but that was negative. Um, his halter monitor as an outpatient showed that he was having, despite being on saltolol, um, although it was the initial dose, he was having uh, nine episodes of non-sustained BT in a 24-hour period, and he had 3,000 uh, ventricular ectopics, uh, which was multi multifocal. Um, he was sent for genetics, and the uh, original arrhythmogenic panel came back negative um, on the first year of when he was getting assessed. So he was then, because he was quite active, he was referred to our centre, and he was uh, all of this information came to us, and he was seen by us. Um, and a relevant family history was taken. So he has three children, two sons, one's 25, one's 21, and one's 19. They're all very active. They're a very active family. So the uh, eldest son is a triathlete. He's always been asymptomatic. The second son is active. Um, he's also been, um, well, he's had some palpitations, but it's been more aware since his father's diagnosis. And um, his daughter is plays hockey and racket sports. Now we saw Mr. X at the same time as the children, went through all of his assessments and we thought that we'd start uh, from the beginning. So given the consideration of the small complexes on his original ECG, the fact that he was pacing dependent and the fact that he had um, quite significant um, ectopy on his 24 hour tape and still having non-sustained VT, we did up titrate Mr. X's medication, but we also repeated and sent off for further genetics because we felt that there may have been some conduction disease and there may be something else going on. <clears throat> so with the children, what would you like to do? So initial screens often are ECGs and just echocardiograms, but these are very active children. So these are the options that you may consider. Would you do an ECG, an ECG with a signal average um, signal average ECG, because we're considering is this an arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy? Uh, would you do an echo and ETT, an echo and MRI, or other? Other being CPET or um, halters and things like that. <clears throat> so I'll go through the tests that we decided to do. So the first initial test with all the children was actually ECGs and echoes. Um, so this is the eldest son. As you can see that he has some similar features to his father in terms of he's got inf his inferior leads have, do have small complexes, but he doesn't have evidence of any T-wave inversion. And he does have um, a single ectopy on his um, ECG here, which uh, can be considered to you know, not be a high burden or normal in initial ECG. So maybe a 24 hour tape may be warranted for him. He's the triathlete, the eldest son, and this is his echocardiogram. So as you can see, um, when we actually index and measure his LV, it's mildly dilated, so he's 58 millimetres. As Zeph had said earlier, the BSC cutoff has now gone from 56 and above, um, but he has good systolic function. The suggestion of his right ventricle will be slightly enlarged as well. And this, you may consider this as um, symmetrical and is this athletic adaptation in this gentleman because he is a triathlete and he exercises a lot. So going on to his brother, the one that has palpitations, when he stopped taking his caffeine, the palpitations did go away, but he exercises and swims, um, but his echocardiogram was normal. His 24 hour tape only showed nine isolated PVCs and this was his uh, ECG. So generally, his ECG is okay. He does have prominent U waves. Um, he doesn't quite meet the LVH criteria, but in lead one and AVL, you may say that his QRS complexes are small also. And now going on to the daughter. So her ECG, uh, so she, the other two gentlemen, their signal average ECGs came back normal. Uh, or they just had one out of uh, three that was abnormal, but his um, Miss V's 
Signal average ECG showed three abnormalities. <clears throat> her echocardiogram was normal uh, and her 24-hour tape didn't show any significant um, high burden of PVCs. But again, you may say in lead one and AVL, her QRS complexes are very small. Um, but otherwise, there's no T-wave abnormalities here. Summary of Mr. X's three children. Um, they are very, very subtle suggestions, but nothing that throws, you know, barn door uh, a uh, towards a uh, particular inherited cardiomyopathy. But given the fact of Mr. X's uh, presentation, what we found, um, and uh, his MRI findings, these may suggest that we may want to investigate these three children a bit further. So the eldest son went on to having an MRI, which confirmed biventricular uh, dilatation, but good uh, uh, low normal function. But as you can see, there is scar, midwall scar in the basal lateral wall there, the inferior wall, the anterior wall there, and then on short axis, he's also got quite significant scar here. <clears throat> and he is asymptomatic, but this is quite concerning because that's quite a high burden of scar. His brother, <clears throat> again, sorry, these images may not be as clear, um, but he has got scar or suggestion of scar in the lateral wall. Um, and there was also scar, a suggestion of infralateral wall scar here, but obviously it's quite hazy and patchy. Um, so he did go on to having another MRI at another centre. The reason why I haven't put those photos up, although it did confirm what we found here, again, they were quite hazy, so I felt that this was probably the best picture to give you, but because there was two different centres and two different MRIs, two different operators confirming the same thing, it was deemed that Mr Z did also have significant scar. Now, Miss V, who's the youngest daughter who doesn't have any symptoms and probably the most subtle uh, features on all of her screen so far, actually had quite ex surprisingly extensive scar as well. So basal, lateral, in the mid, she's got quite significant scar here. In the inferior wall, she's got significant scar. The anterior wall, infralateral wall, she's got quite significant scar. Now, this whole family was discussed in the, the MDTs and we was waiting for genetics on Mr. X, which we we're specifically looking out for filling in C. And the second genetic test did come back with a pathogenic frame shift variance vitamin C. Mr. Y went on to having his genetics, which confirmed the same variant. Mr. Z, second son, he went on to having genetics, which confirmed the same variant. And Miss V, who also had genetics, confirmed the same variant. We then went on to having another consultation with the whole family. Mr. X did have an ICD in place, um, but as uh, family, it was discussed, uh, and because of the quite significant um, uh, malignancy of this uh, variant and the scar pattern and how the father had presented and the fact that the family are quite uh, active, it was deemed that it may it will be in their best interest if they all had primary prevention ICDs, which they all agreed to and they were keen to have them. So. I just wanted to highlight this case because um, obviously the three children can have had very, very subtle features and often we may stop at ECG and uh, echocardiogram um, when we're screening family members and we don't umbrella term everyone and go on and doing the full works on everyone, but sometimes it's very important to do very thorough investigation. The only other outstanding things that are outside the remit of this case study is what we went on to doing is discussing exercise prescription. Um, Obviously, we're a sports cardiology centre, so we're very keen on that. We do yearly testing on these family and we do regular uh, exercise tolerance tests to see ectopic burdens, what, they, uh, what happens in recovery and peak exercise. Uh, and every year we ask them what exercise they're doing, because although they understand the risk, they may get comfortable and push themselves. And in fact, one of the son was very keen to do cold water, open swimming, um, and he's got an ICD in place. And we obviously told him that wasn't wise. Thank you very much. Um, can we ask for the panel to come back to um, just discuss this case a bit, if there's anyone left with us? Fantastic.
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so it's very interesting to, um, you know, look at the investigations and see that the the, uh, the original clinical findings um, were very limited um, to show towards a diagnosis of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy uh, until we went on to um, have an MRI. And I'm just wondering on the panel's view of whether or not, you know, family screening of members should act for these type of conditions should actually include MRIs uh, more routinely. Uh, who, who's going to pay? Who's going to pay the tax bill for that? <laughs> That's probably what I would say. I mean, I, I, joke, joking aside, I can't remember a case of such an unfortunate family where you found such gross things in people where you wouldn't have expected to find anything. The majority of referrals we would get like that. It, when I showed you the uh, the, uh, the sort of the bars of things that we do uh, in terms of diagnosis made of the 30 percent of normal scans we do, a lot of it is family screening and inherited. Um, a lot of those normals are that or, or they've got mild. You know, they may have a genotype without a phenotype as such with some minor things like Crips. So it's very difficult. I think that um, I mean, this was a really, really good case because I, if I would just if this hadn't been an inherited meeting, I'd have been sitting in an MDT with this case. I'm like this is just sarcoid. Mixed pattern scar, VT. I, I was going to ask you what ethnicity was. I mean, you know, if he was African Caribbean, African American, that's just going to be sarcoid. This. Um, to add to the mix, Caucasian. We, Caucasian. We, we, there's a similar family at that St. Thomas's, mm -hmm. and another similar younger family here at the Brompton, both who've had very abnormal MRIs yeah. with normal ECGs and some with, with some with normal ECGs and all with normal echoes. So, you know, it's it, difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So I suppose the problem is, say, is that, you know, you can throw the net out wide here, but you're going to end up with a lot of families where you don't find much. And so it's just about, re I mean, to be honest, the answer to your question is about resource usage. You know, um, how many of these people, how, how many people like this would you send and what would be the yield of doing it? It's really difficult because I mean, think what difference the MRI has made to this family. I mean, it really has, you know, it's completely altered you know, a lot of what you would have done here. So. Uh, James, do you, do you have, uh, want to make a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I agree with what you said completely. I mean, I think what would sway me in this case was the MRI was the most abnormal thing about the dad, and therefore that does push you into probably doing it because it's likely to be the highest yield test. So I think in this case, I probably would have done the MRI up front only because I mean, I, I don't know. The other thing is without getting too bogged down the CMR, do we think that STIR imaging is now low flow artifact? Um, I suspect yeah, it I, probably is, ironically, but yeah, I, 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 I would agree on the MRI. I, I think it, uh, it was deemed as possible, which is leaning towards the fact that it was low flow. I, I think the appearance of the scar, you know, in, in the proband throws us down the route of thinking about screening MRI in, in this case. And, you know, ECG and the presentation with, with ventricular arrhythmia, I think, raises the, you know, the, the yield of MRI in, 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 in relatives. Um, the, Mighty, any comments about the ICDs in, in the three um, first degree relatives? And and I suppose the actioning of of genotypic information and, and risk stratification in this case. I I have to say that I think this this case was discussed to nauseating internally, and then with the family and and back and forward and that, and I'm not very sure that since we are all recognizing how anecdotal this is, how much we want to learn for the next case. So the most important thing is individualization. And I mean, I do remember the era where we lived with the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, where the way to learn if an ICD works was to put one. So, so and then we have series of papers with people with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and ICDs, and then we learned that all of them had non-sustained VT and they didn't make any difference. So I think the filamin C unfortunately is open this chapter. Um, we we are finding a, I mean I, I have a, a, a couple of identical twins that have breast subcutaneous ICD feeling guilty and then both of them had got appropriate discharge um, before the age of 16 and I feel very happy about it right um, and I'm, I'm not very sure 
how we are learning about it. And I think that was the dilemma with this family. So I think how unlucky you have to be to give a monogenic disorder to all your children. How can you live with it? How can you give one to the dad and then <laughs> tell the kid that the children you have the same thing? So I think this is the dilemma of inherited cardiac conditions and is for time to us to learn whether this was something we would do again or perhaps we will have to replace in the future. And I think that's that's the humble answer that I could give here. And, and you'd favour subcut ICDs in the, these young patients to begin with? I, I think this, unless it's a very good reason to put one, anything inside the heart, you have good experience, you have things we, we tend to to not to put anything in the heart if we can, you know, I have to say, and particularly in these situations, I think that's that's what we are tending to do. And maybe a question for Anthony, how much of a red flag is is the original presentation in the proband of of uh, of an out of hospital arrest VT? Did, did, does that raise your level of concern about the three um, the, the three children? Well, obviously, I mean, the, this is a case where you have to get to the bottom of it 100% and you will not stop investigating them until you are satisfied that you have either reached the diagnosis or that you, you have used all possible diagnostic tests that could be available. Um, it did bring in mind indeed the, the filament C because it has this, this, uh, this uh, qualities of, of for filament C um, the, the extended late enhancement, the, the cardiac arrest. But I would be a little bit more conservative in the management. Um, I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't have done the same 100%, but what I'm saying is that we don't know enough um, before we, uh, um, we uh, risk stratify filament C. And as this case nicely demonstrates that it can run in the family and has um, significant expression, um, we all have, not we, not all of us, but, but some of us have seen also cases where the penetrance is variable and it's very difficult to make decisions based on the genetic um, result only, e even in filament C. Um, and therefore, I think we are only at the beginning of, of this journey with this new gene, relatively new gene, and, and we will learn much more in the future. There might be environmental factors there, there might be uh, other genes modifying the expression, um, so um, although this is a great case, I wouldn't use it necessarily, and I agree with Mighty, as an example set um, for uh, other similar cases as well. Um, these cases need to be 100% uh, individualized, and of course, patients need to understand what are the pros and cons, and maybe, for example, uh, an, an implantable um, uh, loop recorder would help here in those who have late enhancement, late, late enhancement, but not so much arrhythmia uh, at the moment or zero arrhythmia because you don't, you wouldn't probably expect them to develop arrhythmia overnight. Maybe they would de develop arrhythmia over a short period of time and you would have the opportunity to act upon that rather than go for primary prevention. But yes, to answer your initial question, because of probably I'm talking too much, uh, yes, uh, that's a red flag and I would investigate the family in, in depth. Super, thanks very much. I, I think both of those cases have shown, well, what a fast moving field um, ICC and cardiomyopathy is, the challenges that we all face and, and the importance of multidisciplinary working and making decisions in teams. So um, yes, hopefully um, we've, we've we've managed to, to, to learn a few things from them. Um, so I, I think that is going to be the end of today's um, uh, session. So uh, I, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for making it such an enjoyable session to chair. I've learned a lot. Um, I'd like to thank Amanda, my co-chair, who's, who's, who's been fantastic and, and helped put together this um, this program. And, and I think most of all, uh, we need to say a big, big thank you to Dr. Rachel Bassianin and Andrew Marlow um, from the South London ODN, who've been really central to putting this all together and have, have, have worked really hard to put the whole program together. So a, a really huge thank you to them. Um, there, there are, I think, another three days in total um, over the course of the next year. So please um, listen out and, and watch out for the next dates for those and, and come back and, and, and sign up for them.
So the next date is the Inherited Arrhythmia session, which is the April the 26th. And um, for all attendees that have attended today, there'll be uh, an email being sent out with feedback and multiple choices, uh, which will allow you to get your certificate of attendance for today. So. Uh, thank you very much and thank you to Brian. It's been a lovely day. Thanks to Amanda for, for remembering all the important things that <laughs> we were meant to say. So uh, thank you all. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.